Would you join me in standing as we read together God's Word today? We are now in Genesis chapter 6, and we're dealing with the cataclysm and the great flood that God brought upon the face of the earth. Genesis chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every, how much? Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. Listen, I want to repeat that verse because God is, is also an emotional being. It, it, the person of God, is, there, there's an emotional side. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Listen, you don't want to grieve God. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day in which you've given to us. And Father, I pray that we will heed the warning of this passage. Father, there is a judgment coming. Father, help us to be wise and first of all, make certain that we are saved, that we are safe in Christ. Father, I pray that second, we would be mindful of our families. Father, I pray for parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, aunts and uncles here today. Father, I pray that we would be mindful of the condition of our own family. And then, Father, I pray for our world, for every nation and every people. And Father, I pray for America today. Father, help us to see the error of our sins and ways, and Father, to turn back to you. We pray this in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the biblical account of Noah's Ark is widely known, but, but, but few really comprehend the magnitude of the event of Noah's Ark. You see, just six chapters into the Word of God, we find this. God saw that the wickedness of man was great. Folks, this is a far cry from Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, that says, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. You see, it went from being very good to being very bad in just six chapters. But in the midst of all the wickedness that was found in the world, the Bible says that God found a righteous man named Noah. Listen to Genesis 6 verse 9. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And last week we looked at Enoch who walked with God. This is the second person the Bible says walked with God. Let me ask you a question. Are you walking with God? Or are you walking with the world? Are you walking in sin or are you walking with the Savior? Today, I want you to examine your heart. It's easy to look and make judgments about someone else. But what about you? Are you walking with the Lord? God saw Noah 
and said he walked with him. God commanded Noah then to build an ark. One of the things about walking with God is you will be obedient to his word. And so examine your heart. Do you have that relationship with God? Are you walking with him? And are you able to see that by the obedience that is found in your life? Noah built an ark. The size of the ark is determined by the word cubit. Now, using the most conservative figure, the ark would have been 438 feet long. That means it was about a, a football and a half long, football field and a half long. Y'all been to a football game, right? You, uh, you've watched the Jaguar, about, about a foot, about 150 yards. It was also 73 feet wide and 44 feet tall, and, and it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. Now, church, you can get a lot done when you have 120 years to do that. <laughs> but but you got to start somewhere, amen? 120 years, but the Bible says that during that 120 years, Noah was also preaching righteousness to a people where the people had multiplied on the face of the earth. I find this interesting because as a pastor, I'm looking forward to a baptism coming up. We had a great night out on Tuesday night. But think about Noah. For 120 years he preached. There were no baptisms. There, there were no conversions. There was no changing of heart. Listen, that gets frustrating after a while, but the Bible says he was faithful for 120 years to preach God's Word. Well, some have wondered how Noah got all the animals on board. Scripture indicates to us in Genesis chapter 6, verse 20, that the animals actually came to him. Listen to what the Bible says, a fowl after their kind cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come to thee. <laughs> so while Noah was building, the Bible says the animals obeyed God and came to him. It, you know, it's interesting that God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, isn't he? Uh, the animals obeyed him, but the people didn't. But when everyone was then safely on board, the Bible says that God's the one who shut the door. Listen to what Genesis 7, 16 says. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And that's when the catechism takes place. You see, the Bible says that the fountains of the deep, they spewed water. Uh, some people uh, get the idea that it just started raining. Maybe it started with a drizzle and then poured down. Folks, this was an eruption. Uh, the fountains of the deep, uh, they exploded. In fact, as we learned on our Wednesday night creation series, there was so much pressure underneath the ground with the fountains of the deep, and we preached about that before, how that God watered the earth from the fountains from below. But, but here are the fountains of the deep literally exploded. And, and in fact, we learned that they exploded with so much force that, that much of the rock and debris was spewed up into space. That's why the moon has its greatest craters facing the earth. Not on the opposite side, on the dark side of the moon. You see, if it was like scientists have, have told us, a bombardment from uh, meteors and things from outer space, then the moon, the dark side, should have uh, all the craters. But that's not the case. It's the side facing the earth. And it was because of the fountains of the deep literally exploding, separating the continents one from another. And all that water shooting up into the atmosphere and then coming back down again and the canopy of water around the earth 
then being broken up and coming back down. It was a deluge of water. Listen to what the Bible says here in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month. Now that's pretty specific, isn't it? The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, we have talked about how all this happens on Wednesday night, but today I want us to look at the lessons spiritually that we learn from the cataclysm. And the first one is pretty simple. God punishes sin. Do you know we live in a day and an age where people don't really believe that God punishes sin? They live as if there is no God. They live as there is no standard of righteousness. I wasn't going to read this, but if you have your Bible, it's not in your notes, turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to begin at verse 4. Because there are things about this message that I refer to that are in this passage. And, and I don't have this passage in the message at all, but I want to read it. Beginning in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, God spared not the angels that sinned. Did you hear that? God punishes sin. Amen. That's the first point. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Listen, there's a, there's a greater punishment, a lake of fire awaiting. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Church, listen to me. People aren't paying attention to the examples. Did you figure that out? People live as if there is no punishment by God upon sin. Let's look at verses 11 through 13. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The point is, Noah lived in a day of great, wickedness. Now this almost sounds like I'm repeating what was said last week about Enoch. Listen, wickedness had multiplied on the face of the earth. The Bible says corruption had taken hold. You know what corruption means? It means to decay. This world is decaying. Y'all ever... I, I know y'all live in such nice houses, this never, ever happened to you. But did you ever get a rat that died in a wall or something? Anybody that ever happened to you? And the stink is unbelievable, amen? Listen, the, that's, that, that's decay, that's corruption. And the stink of this earth, it, it, the, the, the scent of it raised up before God is what the Bible says. Listen, sin brings death, and death brings corruption. And notice how it is expressed. The Bible says the world was filled with violence. Uh, violence means to willingly cause destructive acts. Listen, we see violence in our world today, don't we? Uh, on great scales. I'm not talking about the occasional murder. I'm talking about the, the willful destruction of, of human life. And you know the most dangerous place in the world to live today where that is? It's in the womb. That's exactly right. I'm going to tell you, the corruption of this world, it is a stench unto God. 
And we see the violence that is expressed. Listen to what the Bible said in verse 5. The thoughts of men's hearts was only evil continually. It was into that kind of world that God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. For it repenteth me, it grieves me that I have made them. Jesus then went on in the New Testament to describe this kind of day. In Matthew 24, verse 38, it says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. They were living their lives with no thought of God. Let me ask you today, You're here at church today, but when you're not coming to church on a Sunday, do you live your life without thought of God? Or every day do you think, you know what? There's a holy God that I serve. Uh, Are you waking up every day and spending time with God in Bible study and devotion? Notice this, they scoffed at Noah's message. The flood was a punishment on a world that had forsaken God and scoffed at the truth of the message of the Word of God. Now, why did they do that? Well, you know, if if you reject the story of Noah, and people do today, what they're rejecting is the idea of a God who punishes sin. I'm telling you, God's Word continually reminds us. It gives us a warning that there is punishment for sin. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said this, He who does not believe that God will punish sin will not believe that he will pardon it through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. You see, they they, they don't believe God punishes sin, so therefore they do not need a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so people live as if there is no God. But the Bible clearly teaches that God does punish sin. Ezekiel 18, verse 4 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Listen, sin brings consequences. And the first thing we need to understand is God punishes sin. Does everybody get that today? Well, I'll move on to the second point then. Because the second point that we see in this passage is God prizes His saints. Are you a saint? Have you been saved? Has God set you aside? Have you received the Lord into your heart as as the king and ruler of your life, your savior? Notice this, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And God prizes His saints. Listen, in the midst of a world filled with wickedness, God found one righteous man named Noah. Listen, I hope that if Jesus came right this moment, there would be more than one righteous man or woman, teenager, boy or girl here today. Listen to me. Noah's great-grandfather was Enoch who walked with God, and I'm looking around today, and I see some grandparents here today. I see some great-grandparents here today. Listen, there's something to be said for a grandma or a grandpa who loves God. Amen. Listen, you need to pass down your spiritual heritage to your children, to your grandchildren, to your great-grandchildren. I know people who go to great lengths to make sure that they're passing down an inheritance. Listen, the greatest inheritance you're ever going to give is a walk with God. You need to spend more time thinking about how am I going to pass down a godly heritage to my children, to my grandchildren, than, than you need to give to passing down the first dollar. Listen, that's what's important. You need to pass down like Enoch passed down to Noah. 
And by the way, Noah is not a myth. I know some people who say, well, you know what, that's one of those mythological stories. Listen, if Noah is a myth, then Jesus is a liar, and he's not our Lord and Savior. Because Jesus specifically mentions this person named Noah by name. Noah is a real person. And everything about Noah's account in the book of Genesis is exactly true just the way God's Word states it. And Jesus reaffirmed this very message when he quoted about Noah. In Genesis 6-9, we are told three truths about Noah. First of all, he was a just man. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 7, it says this, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark. Church, listen to me. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to the saints today. Amen. There's a judgment coming. And as a pastor, it doesn't thrill my soul to proclaim judgment. But I'm telling you, there's a judgment coming. We need to get ready for it. You need to get your family ready for it. Because judgment is coming. When I look at this land, and just yesterday I saw that, that, that coming on Netflix, you know Netflix has some new leadership. Did you know that? They hired Obama to help lead Netflix. And the first thing that's taken hold, you know, the same man that brought us a rainbow-colored white house now wants to turn your house into a rainbow color with homosexuality. Listen, this is no joke. They are introducing a cartoon on Netflix, and you know children will be attracted to cartoons, and it's all about homosexuality. That's disgusting. Listen, that's not what you need in your house. It's not what I need in not my house. It's not what we need in homes across America. Once again, pushing the homosexual agenda on this nation, the Obamas are continuing to press that without any compunction whatsoever. I'm telling you, there's a, there's a judgment coming. Amen. Listen, there's no other way that you can state this. Why in the world would you produce a cartoon about hero characters that are homosexual? There's a judgment coming on America. There's a judgment coming on this world. Listen, God is not mocked. Did you notice that passage from 2 Peter that God led me to, to quote just a little while ago? Listen, even as Sodom and Gomorrah were turned to ashes, there is a judgment coming. Noah was a just man. And in the midst of all the sin, he remained faithful. Second of all, he was perfect in his generation. That doesn't mean he never sinned. Church, listen to me. Christians are not sinless. But Christians, by their very nature of having Jesus as their King, their Savior, their Lord, we ought to sin less, amen? And we ought never call that which God says is sin as righteous. There's another conference coming up besides the Southern Baptist Convention. And some Southern Baptist entity leaders have already said that they will attend it's called Revoice, the Revoice Conference. And what it's about is about trying to make homosexuality acceptable in the church. Church, listen to me. We are living in times of spiritual corruption. Listen, Noah... Did, the word perfect doesn't mean he never sinned, but it, but, but it means that, that, that he sought to live for the Lord. He sought to living, live according to the Word of God. Don't take that which God says is evil and say it's righteous. We live by this book. And we need to 
to stand firm on the word of God and call that which God calls unholy, we need to call it unholy. Listen, not only that, but he also walked with God. Listen, when you're walking with God, you ought to be able to hear his voice. Amen. Amen. Do you know the difference between right and wrong? We're living in a world that says wrong is right and right is wrong. And the child of God had better know the word of God so that you'll know the difference. Well, third, I'm thankful that in a world filled with sin, our God still provides salvation. Because there are none of us that are right. No, not one. We have all sinned. We have all done that which is wrong. I'm thankful that God provides salvation. Let's look at verses 17 through 19. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark, and keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Now notice this. God told Noah to build an ark. That word ark is the Hebrew word aron. And it means to build a box. Basically, he said, Noah, you need to build a box. And I'm sure as a woodworker, he was thinking a box. And God said, no, you got to get a bigger vision, Noah. I'm not talking about a a box this big. I'm talking about a big box. Listen, that's a big box, amen? That's a lot of wood, a football and a half long. That's a big box. And although he had never seen an ocean, and although he probably had never even seen rain, Noah built a box, a big box. You see, when God tells you to do something, too often we sit and think, now does that make sense? Listen, we need to do what God says. We need to obey His Word because He was preparing a place of safety for His family. Now church, listen to me. God always provides a place of safety for those who truly place their faith in him. And when the fountains of the deep were broken up and and the continents literally separated and, and when the rain became a deluge Noah and his family were safe in the ark of God. I want to conclude by just saying there is a place of safety today and it's in Jesus. You see, the Bible talks about being in Jesus Christ. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Isn't that what it says? If any man, woman, teenager, boy, or girl be in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so today in closing, let me just ask you, are you in Christ? Do you know for certain there's been that place and that time when you put your faith in Jesus? You trusted him as the Lord, the ruler, the king of your life, and that you are in Christ? That's God's ark of safety today, Jesus Christ. Well, the parallels between Noah's Ark and our day are astonishing. During the days of Noah, the Bible says there was a drastic increase in knowledge. Church, we are living in a day and an age 
of increased knowledge. It, it says that during the day and age of Noah, there was a, a, an increased desire for pleasure. And we are living in a day and an age where people are seeking to please the flesh instead of the Lord. It, it was a day in which the sacredness of marriage had been forgotten and set aside. And instead, every imagination and every thought was evil continually. Folks, does that describe our world today? Amen. You see, Jesus gave us a sign. Jesus taught us that there was another judgment day coming. Listen to what he said in 2 Peter 3.10, what the Bible says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And Jesus gave us a sign as to when to know when that time was coming. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Church, I believe we're there. I believe that judgment is coming. There's punishment on sin. God prizes his saints. And God provides a way of salvation. What about you? Have you received the Lord? What about your family? Are they safe in Jesus today? What about our community? What about the people that we come in contact with? Are they right with God? And what are we doing to share the message of the gospel? Whether they receive it or not, it is still our job to tell it. Amen. Are we being faithful and obedient?